just say thank you guys for attending this weekend uh, for our first virtual barbell medicine pain and rehab seminar. Hopefully it's been beneficial for you guys and you've gotten a lot out of it. I've enjoyed talking to each of you uh, that have commented and submitted uh, questions throughout this weekend. And then uh, now we're going to do our kind of traditional Q&A that we do at the end of all of our seminars, obviously just virtual at this point. So we've curated some questions from folks throughout the weekend. And we're going to go through each of these and do our best to answer them. Uh, I don't mind. I'll narrate this, Derek, and then we'll uh, bounce around answers for these questions. So the first one comes from Sean. What are your thoughts on programming for rehab? Uh, and we're going to have this as kind of a broad context, I take it, and then I can expand on it afterwards. I think we are by and large severely underdosing a lot of our athletes in rehab. And I use that in the general, like just broad strokes rehabilitation term. I think we are missing the boat by not having our athletes at least try and get as much exposure to overall conditioning as they possibly could to reap the benefits of it. And this could be just accepting that there are other ways to train other than just what the athlete is currently doing. And specific to the talks, you know, we've been through this weekend, having a athlete status post ACL reconstruction in the gym more than just twice a week, uh, doing low intensity steady state cardio or doing some basic fundamental movement drills and, and starting to resistance train, I think increases their overall capacity for athleticism, which really should be our goal. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, if we're taking an individual who's not meeting physical activity guidelines, the real game with programming there is finding where to start and what they are willing to do. The type of exercise, the specific sets and reps do not matter nearly as much as just advocating that they do something. We are likely missing the boat a little bit as rehabilitation professionals by trying to paint at, or paint individuals into a corner and advocating they do a specific type of exercise exercise instead of just finding out what they want to do, what they are willing to do, and then trying to increase capacity from there. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good broad overview. I don't have a ton to add. Um, just meeting people where they're at, seeing what they're currently dealing with, what are they trying to build back toward as an accomplish? So goal setting and then dosing an activity appropriately over time, and then hopefully progressing it. Uh, as Derek was talking about, I think that's one of the uh, unfortunate things that happen in rehab is we just remain under dosage a lot of times and we don't progress people. So there's nothing wrong in my book with three sets of 10 of some type of movement, but how do we progress that over time uh, for those that need it? And so having some type of like building blocks to work with or basic training foundational principles like specificity, progressive loading, realizing that we need to make individual variations and differences for folks specific to their needs and demands over time. Um, and this realizing like, what is the population that you're working with? Is this someone that's a uh, quote unquote general population that we do just need to get active and start doing uh, small kind of changes and behavior throughout time to help with their experience? Or are these athletes that we're trying to get back to the field and having some type of return to sport criteria would be necessary in that process. Um, so I think those are kind of the big things that we struggle with as far as just dosage of activity being uh, appropriately given to the person that we're working with. The secondary aspect of that, could you talk a bit about clients that have had really negative experiences with medical practitioners not listening to them and who have lost faith in, the, faith in their chances of getting better and the medical establishment's ability to help them in general, given what we know about patient expectations impacting outcomes, is it necessary to convince them that they can get better for them to get better? And if so, what can be done to change their minds about the potential outcome? So kind of two questions there. How do you help individuals who are dealing with uh, maybe some not so great interactions throughout the medical system? And then also how do we work with their expectations? I think we can't underestimate the power of the phrase, well, that sucks. Like you need to acknowledge that they've had a bad experience. And I've certainly had plenty of patients who have been told things by practitioners that I would consider uh, not good advice. And it is establishing that new relationship. And 
being able to communicate with people and understand where they're at is an integral part of just the human experience, if not a re rehabilitation professional's job. We're all going to have those negative experiences. I've certainly been told things from individuals that have impacted me in a negative way, but it is that acknowledgement that there is hope. Now, I don't think that you have to expect to get better first in order to get better. I think that's a little bit of a cyclic phenomenon um, in that you can start the process with very low expectations, but if you start seeing you can do more than you thought you could do prior, then that starts to influence your expectations. Whereas if you come in with the expectation that you're going to have progress, that probably makes it a little bit easier, but each person's path is unique to them. And this kind of gets back at the big theme of how many different ways can I get a message across? So I may be saying the same thing, like, for example, hey, you, you need to be more active, but I don't think anyone has ever been more active from just being told they need to be more active. Like if, if only it were as simple as telling our significant other that they need to calm down and that would get them to calm down. Like it's how do I address this issue in front of me? And sometimes you can face it head on. Sometimes you need to take a, a roundabout way. And especially if there's been some negative expectations in the past or, or especially negative messaging, sometimes we really need to circumvent the problem. We need to work around it instead of working through it. That way the individual who's been told these negative things can really gain some perspective on why what they were told is wrong. I think it's great. I don't have anything to add to that. Thoughts on how to increase participation, compliance, and accessibility for youth resistance training. I'll kick that to you, Derek. Normalize it. And that really is the biggest thing. I think we have to hit critical mass in individuals seeing that it is safe to train that it is effective for overall athletic performance, that young individuals can put weight on the bar and see progress. And I will even caveat this further. If there is one component where we really need to increase participation it is with our young female athletes. We need to be the biggest advocates we can to get them in the gym, comfortable lifting weights and seeing that they can get stronger. Now, how do we do this? One, you start with one individual. This is going to be a movement that builds from small numbers, just like many other things. If we start getting some athletes, especially young female athletes in the gym, they start squatting, they start deadlifting, they start resistance training, and then those start to manifest as results in the field, I think it eventually takes care of itself. But if we're trying to start a movement, I think sometimes trying to cast a really wide net of just messaging across the board may not be the best way. But if we can get one person in the gym, then we can start getting two people in the gym and then three and then five. And before we know, it, we have our own Fibonacci sequence of people in the gym lifting. And that is how we do it. I like that Fibonacci sequence of folks in the gym. It's good. That could be a t-shirt. In regards to exercise prescription, do you see any role for rehab exercises or a more specific loading of a body part? Or would you rather go about selecting activities that might be aligned with the patient's goals and things that may have difficulties within daily tasks and works on, work on these gradually? If we would give a more specific exercise for a given body part, is there any value in that, in that apart from just doing the same thing? Doing something is better than nothing. So I think it depends on case context and the person that I'm working with. Um, some folks, I probably don't want them to be, to be viewing what we're doing as just like just rehab. And so I'm okay with like trying to get them to view it as still training. Other folks, I worry about pushing the envelope too much too soon. And I kind of wanted them to look at this as like a rehabilitative process where they're not ready to go back to sport. So I think it really depends on the mindset of the person I'm working with, but also then the case. When it comes to like specific exercises, like uh, the kind of things that I see big ag big advocacy for would be like post-op scenarios, as well as like uh, acute muscle injury cases, stuff like that. Then I definitely think there needs to be specific what we think of, of as rehab exercises. 
Um, I can think of like uh, several post-op shoulder cases I've worked with where, yeah, first several weeks, it's like, how do we get back active range of motion while we're respecting the physiological healing process of what happened in the surgery? And so that's going through those very basic kind of fundamental steps of returning range of motion, active assisted, and then active unloaded ranges. And then as we get that back, progressing into more loading based. And then if it's an athlete sport specific base, so it's kind of is going through this very uh, methodical rehabilitative process. Other people, if I'm dealing with like persistent low back pain cases, I may want them to see is this is like, yeah, this is resistance training. This is getting you active. This is loading your body. This is a cool thing to do. You don't need to be like in rehab in that context. So I think it depends on the mentality of the individual I'm working with, the case context, uh, as far as like how I'm going to uh, talk to them about what they're doing and then whether I'm going to give specific exercises. I'm a fan of getting someone to load a specific area that's symptomatic um, potentially playing off of placebo-like contextual effects and also just giving them confidence in loading that area, especially if they have a propensity of wanting to offload that area. Yeah, I, I think there's a little bit of a conversation here about want versus need. And individuals with more what I, I would consider general uh, pain presentations, there I'm going to have a lot more discussions about what they want to do. And there, it may be accommodating what their desires are. However, if you're coming into my clinic with a hamstring injury, uh, we're going to do some very specific exercises. And there, our objective goals are much more clear and defined. If you're coming in status post and ACL reconstruction, you can want to do sports all day long, but we need to make sure that your quadricep strength is up to the standards that it needs to be there. We're likely going to be doing very specific rehab exercises. It is case specific, but I think to muddy the water a little bit, Often in the acute phase, if we're going to classify an injury as such, there are very specific quote unquote rehab exercises that are often beneficial. Whereas if it is more towards the chronic side of things, then it is a little bit more of a discussion about meeting the individual where they're at and finding what their goals are and what we can do to get started. Okay. I think that's, yeah, that's all of that one. Uh, the question is regarding the discussion on moving away from body region silos for management of musculoskeletal pain. Uh, I also think that's, a, as a side note, a great, I think it was an editorial to go read for folks if you've not read it. Based on your experience in practice, how many individuals need a more structured rehabilitation program in the context of reducing pain and disability? Would that be sufficient enough or is there a need for more structured or specific program? Yeah, and that kind of goes hand in hand with what we were just talking about with the prior question. I think it just depends. Uh, some people, we generally just need to get back to life activities and function and like encouragement. And then other people, we need a much more like rigid structured plan to implement to get them to where they want to be able to go back and do you know some type of specific activity. Yeah, I think here, this is a really hard thing for a lot of rehabilitation professionals because we want to give this very structured plan. And I can tell you, I, I have this discussion with parents a lot when I see adolescent athletes that are just not meeting physical activity guidelines. They want a very set uh, regimented recipe to get their child better. And it really is, they just need to be active. And here, I don't think a really structured rehabilitation program is warranted. It's just you need to do more than what you're currently doing, and you need to find things that you enjoy doing. I think sometimes we get a little bit overly driven towards this conversation around specificity, and we forget that there are hundreds of thousands, if not infinite ways of moving, and all of which can essentially be an exercise. And what works for you and what you enjoy doing is not what I enjoy doing. And more than anything, it's not about me applying my definition of normal to you. It's about facilitating everyone in front of us finding their own normal. And if that's the case, I may not need to put very strict constraints on what we're doing as far as a structured or specific program. Yeah. I think having, um, giving people aut autonomy and flexibility and programming is a pretty big part of this discussion. Like 
feeling as though they can make changes that need to, or life got crazy and they missed a session. And I, I forget what lecture I talked about this on, but rarely am I like, yeah, you need to double up on Saturday and make all that up. It's like, no, like there's probably another session upcoming for training. And we see that even with like um, behavior change specific, there was one study I referenced in the low back pain uh, discussion on looking at facilitators and barriers to implementing physical activity for those dealing with persistent low back pain. And it's like, one of the biggest things you'll read about because they did a qualitative analysis of, as well and interviewed the folks that were in that. And it's about them feeling as though like there's these very specific recommendations from the rehabilitation clinician of these specific exercises that have to be done on these specific days. And they were like, I just don't feel like I can meet these expectations being placed on me. Or they gave me exercises that I don't even have equipment access to that. So I think having flexibility and their ability to see like, oh, this happened in my day you know, can I pivot and do something differently that might not meet those like very strict guidelines that were given to me? I think that'd be helpful in the long run to help with uh, adherence for physical activity. You mean everyone doesn't have red toe straps swinging from their ceilings that they can do, uh, you know, plank walkouts while one leg is abducted to exactly 28 degrees? Right. I, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if that's what was recommended by some people to some people. Uh, yeah, it even gets at like that idea of like, um, what you were saying with specificity. I think what goes with that is people are like, oh, I have to do these three specific exercises to get myself out of pain. And I've seen this numerous time in barbell medicine consults where they think like that's ad infinitum. Like I can never take away these activities because if I do, my low back pain is going to come back, which also isn't a good place to put someone in. Yeah. I think that is a great point to break up or bring up, um, I have had many athletes come in for consultation who have been told by a prior clinician that they need to do this certain set of exercises. And I just had one last week who had probably 25 exercises that she was doing three times a week uh -huh. because the clinician said that's what she needed to do in order to stay healthy. And it is an interesting conversation of, well, have you tried doing less and I think too often in the rehab context, we want this one-to-one -one ratio of one problem, one solution, when we can probably address or check multiple boxes with a more broad framed approach. Yeah, yeah that's tough. Um, <clears throat> difficult conversations. The body region silo thing, um, I think it sounds great on paper, I question the ability to implement that in our current healthcare system. I don't see us getting rid of patient presents with low back pain, patient presents with shoulder pain. I think because we're always going to be in a position as clinicians of trying to rule things out that may potentially not turn out so well for us if we didn't rule them out. And so, although I like the sound of, you know, removing these body silos, I think in our current healthcare system, it's unlikely. It doesn't mean it's impossible. It's just as hard for me to see how we implement that right now. Jacob asks, in the context of load management for multidirectional athletes with activity-related pain, any strategies for finding areas we can dial back while keeping participation high? This is going to be context-dependent, and it really does come down to what the athlete can tolerate. I think a good coach or a good rehabilitation professional is going to find those activities that an athlete can do in this really goes back to that, like thinking outside the box conversation. And we want this cookbook recipe, let's do it this way, but you have to let an athlete explore their environment and see what they can do with minimal symptoms. And I think trying to quantify jumps or, or quantify maximal effort, you know, things like RPE do come in handy here because, you know, if we're doing a deceleration drill, okay, well, I want you to cut at uh, 70% and athletes will start kind of self-governing there. Um, but it also is finding different drills they can do to change direction. Um, I think one of the more important things you can start doing is structuring how much they can move. A lot of times if I'm doing like a reactive ball drill where we're trying to move forward backwards to the side in the beginning, I'll start out in like 10 square feet 
as they start making progress, we'll move it out to 15 square feet. And the goal is to be able to get it wide enough to where they are getting up to full speed doing these drills. But you can put these constraints on the environment to where they're having to move in smaller spaces to where likely the forces they're experiencing are not going to be as high. Thoughts on the recent term of no C plastic. That's all you, buddy. You don't come on. Um, I mean, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. It's a word that the International Association for the Study of Pain has put out there as a, another descriptor word for someone's experience trying to give a label. I don't know how meaningful it is. So like the official definition from the ISP, you can go to their website, look it up, is that no C plastic pain is pain that arises from altered nociception, despite no clear evidence of actual or threatened tissue damage, causing the activation of peripheral nociceptors or evidence for disease or lesion of the somatosensory system causing that pain. And so instead of it being uh, nociceptive or neuropathic, we've added this additional term of nociplastic. Uh, I don't think that it moves the needle forward in management. I don't think that it's very meaningful at this time, at least it's not been demonstrated. Um, and so I don't really know that it gets us anywhere. I think my further concern is just like applying labels in this kind of broad stroke fashion that doesn't actually add any meaning or further understanding to the discussion of why the individual in front of you is having pain. And in fact, my concern is people just being like, yeah, you have no C plastic pain. Um, don't really know that that gets us anywhere. And it's similar to the conversation we had over the weekend of you're a catastrophizer. Like I wouldn't say that to someone and I don't think it's beneficial or useful. And I wouldn't want to hear someone I'm working with say to me, they think they're a catastrophizer because I'd be like, just, we need to stop and kind of reframe this discussion and move ourselves away from that type of label. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's any reason to believe that it's a necessary label. And I don't think that there's any reason to believe at this time that it's going to do anything differently from a clinical practice standpoint. Um, there's also a discussion that likely needs to be had at some point about the differences between experimentally induced uh, nociception, which could be then rated as painful, non-painful discomforts, so on and so forth, versus lived experiences dealing with those who are having pain in daily living. They're not one in the same. And even though that that's often how they're talked about in pain literature, as far as like inducing of pain, as well as like real life experience of pain uh, out in the real world. So Hopefully that answers your question. I don't, I just don't think it adds that much to the conversation. The next one says, I mentioned something to the effect of, I don't like explain pain. Okay, yeah. So we have a couple parts. This is a longer question. So we have a couple parts highlighted this is a pain and rehab seminar. I think it's useful to find out, find what I can generalize to other areas. What could we take from this weekend and apply to, oh, is that the same? Okay, what, let's go with this. We'll edit that part out. This was a pain and rehab seminar. I think it's useful to find out uh, what I can generalize to other areas. What could we take away from this weekend and then apply to quote unquote prehab in addition to meet physical activity guidelines and be sure to include some strength training. Can we conceptualize pain as a, okay, so we'll stop there. Let's answer that first question, Derek. Um, you got it. I, yeah, no, I just have a visceral hatred of the word. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's just me because it really is like, well, okay, let's just get prepared for life. Um, as far as meet physical activity guidelines and make sure to include some strength training, if I'm going to go back to what I said a moment ago about just telling your significant other to calm down. Like I guarantee you if I walked upstairs and said that to Kim, when she was mad, I'd be sleeping on the couch for the next few nights. It, it is more nuanced than that to use the borrow mess and parlance parlance. Like you have to have these conversations about what the individual is willing to do. And this gets back to, being comfortable having the hard conversations and, and saying, this is where we are. What can I do in order to position myself in the best case scenario to be successful? 
you know, there's a lot of this talk in training about, we just need to go hard every day. We're going to go to war and all these stupid analogies. But frankly, if you look in on, like you play those analogies out, there's a lot of preparation on all fronts. Like we need to make sure we're taking the steps to prepare ourselves to where it's not about going in and and getting red faced and pulling as hard as we can every day. It's did we set ourselves up with our stress management, with our participation in physical activity guidelines, with how we're allocating our time in order to have the best possible outcome. Like this is those things like I'm going to just keep reverting back to it. It is so simple. It's complex. People have difficulty with the basic principles because it is so simple and they feel that everything needs to be churched up. It doesn't. We need to get good at our basic principles. We need to do the things that really are high yield for us, even if they're a little on the boring side. Yeah, I was pondering this question a bit more is there anything we need to add to the national physical activity guidelines is kind of how I'm interpreting this, um, which I would say, no, generally speaking for folks who aren't sports specific athletes, like we can't even get people to meet national physical activity guidelines uh, at this point in time. So that would probably be like, and if you read the world health organization's recent guidelines, that just came out last year. uh, It's any activity is better than none. They even removed the 10 minute bout recommendation for fear of people seeing 10 minutes and not wanting to engage activity. So now it's just get up and do something in hopes to start moving that needle forward because we continuously, if you look at healthy people over the decades, we aren't really moving the needle forward in a meaningful manner to get people active. I don't know why you try to add anything else when we can barely get people to do that. Um, So I wouldn't worry about it. And just as a a relation to that, like that is just cardiospiratory training each week and resistance training twice a week. So uh, we have a lot of information out on that topic. So I wouldn't worry about adding more. I think as far as it relates to like a takeaway to our seminar that would help people out with that on their journey of physical activity implementation implementation is realize that like um, try to find something that you want to do from a point of enjoyment, realize you're not always going to enjoy it, but overall, hopefully you do. It's probably going to feel hard sometimes. That's okay. You may even feel sore, which is where that kind of pain conversation comes in. Is this normal or not? And typically it's perfectly okay. I think that's probably like the big takeaways from the pain lecture as it relates to that. Derek, do you think we can can conceptualize pain as a thermometer, a way of indicating overall status, a manifestation of total stress? No. I would agree. Uh, Yeah, it's it's way more complex than that. And as we've talked about uh, the entire weekend, pain doesn't equal tissue damage, pain, and I don't even like the alarm side of it. Uh, just because I don't think it's a really good analogy out of it. When we're talking about things like a muscle injury, we talked about the other side where you may feel really good, but you're not ready to to return to sport yet. So it goes both ways. Uh, A thermometer really implies that you know what's going on in the environment. And I would say, if anything, where we suck at as rehab professionals is really talking about what's going on in the individual's environment. It's not about what their pain is. It's about what their external stress load is. Yeah, I think a lot of times we're just wanting to try to gain control over the situation. So we're we're looking at ways to revert to a prior premise of pain equals tissue damage equals harm equals hurt. And if we can't reframe away from that foundational premise, then we're looking for a lot of ways to gain these like uh, these metrics like a thermometer. And it doesn't pan out very well. Um, the pain of the alarm actually comes up in just a second, I think, is a question. In atraumatic cases, what is a useful narrative or metaphor they have used to help uh, an uneducated patient start from square one, understand what is happening? Do you want to go first on this one or do you want me to? I don't know that I have very tangible general metaphors. Usually when I'm consulting with someone, I try to find something that's relatable to them. So like, what do they do for a living, whether it's like, uh, an engineer or the mechanic or uh, some other type of profession that I can make an analogy that would be relatable, that's understandable for them. So I don't, I'm not one of those clinicians that's like, yeah, I always use this general metaphor. Uh, unfortunately, I'm curious to your response, Derek. 
Um, I agree that there is some specificity to it, but I do have one that I lean on a lot. And what I'll talk to them about it is their shirt. When trying to explain the manifestation of symptoms that just come on out of the blue, and especially things that have kind of lingered around for a while, my normal analogy is that we normally do not feel the shirt on our backs, except for after I've said something like I just did. And now it is impossible for everyone listening to this conversation to not feel the shirt on their back. And it is because we've now kind of devoted some attention to that. And when symptoms linger around, a lot of times it is because we can't stop feeling the shirt on our back. And a lot of what we do in rehab is really try and direct that focus elsewhere. Like whatever is there may still be there, but now we're not paying as much attention to it. Yeah, I like that. Uh, unfortunately, Amato is not on the call to like, cheer his arms at pain and attention discussion mm -hmm. that you just had. Yeah. He would love it. Okay. So there was been a couple of questions about like pain neuroscience education, explain pain, education on pain, uh, understandably so given my lecture on pain. I think we first have to, cause people are like, do you not like uh, explaining pain to folks? I think we have to define what we mean by explain pain. Uh, and I think that's super individualistic to the person in front of me. So I don't like these kind of general templates that have come out to be like, this is how you discuss pain. These are the magical words you need to try to say to explain pain to folks. And what I worry about in the kind of more common climate these days with this discussion of explain pain is a very neurocentric focus, uh, which has put us into a position that's no different than saying it's in my disc for low back pain. It's in my muscles for low back pain. Now it's in my brain. Um, and that's why we spend time talking about all of these things is because when we look at models, the whole point of transitioning away from biomedicine was to minimize duality. And so then we expanded on that model to biopsychosocial to say, here's some other variables that can be influenced. If we're just saying pain's an output of the brain and we're taking this very neurocentric approach to it, we're actually no different than the original model we tried to move ourselves away from. My other concern is we're not also giving control back to people in the sense of, what am I supposed to do? Turn down my brain, putting out pain, which I've literally had people say to me on consultation, how do I turn down my brain output so I don't feel pain? I'm like, that's not actually possible nor recommended or any of those things given pain is a human experience. If you're living in a society, that's what happens. We have pain experiences. My bigger concern is how do you respond to those situations in which we're having those experiences? And I don't feel the need to tell them what pain is. I want to listen to what they think pain is and maybe we have some talking points. If they say to me, like, I think every time I bend over and feel pain in my low back, that means that my disc is slipping. I'm like, I understand you may think that. We may even talk about, like, where did that narrative come from and work through that. But it doesn't mean that I default to this very neurocentric kind of focus of explanation to someone. That's my biggest concern as we're too busy trying to tell them what their experience is versus listening to them tell us what their experience is and then figuring out how we help them make sense of their experience. So I look at it more of a sense-making process that's individualistic versus a general template to say these are the neurocentric components of someone experiencing pain. Yes, the brain is a part of having lived experiences. It's not the only part, nor is it the, uh, the primary focal point we need to pay attention to. If you go back to Stillwell's uh, quote that I included in my pain lecture, he talks about that great, great article. I will warn you, uh, it's meant as a philosophy paper. It was published in the journal Phenomenology, if I recall correctly, which Phenomenology looks at lived first-person experiences and understanding like existence and being. Uh, being in time would be like one of the main books that you would look at for this type of stuff. And so like it may be heavy and deep, but the point of like moving towards an active model is adding other layers. We're trying to minimize hyper-focusing on a single component. Uh, hopefully that helps explain my position a little bit better. Pain is an alarm goes hand in hand with that. Uh, I agree with what Derek said a second ago. I don't use that metaphor. I don't really agree with that metaphor for a lot of different reasons. Um, I think sometimes in some situations, there may be some fear and apprehension to engaging one's environment related to their pain experience this one usually comes up with like the fear avoidance behavioral model by Vlahan. And I think Losser was actually like the original creator of that model. 
Um, and I don't think that we can say that that's a broadly generalizable model in all situations. What's interesting is these discussions have been ongoing for a number of decades, uh, despite like the popularity of, of some narratives that are ongoing about how to you know, talk about this stuff with patients. And so I have a quote here pulled up because I had the benefit of like preemptively reading these questions ahead of time. And this is from one of Wall's articles in 1979. And he says, pain is taken not as, not as a simple sensory experience signaling the existence of damaged tissue. The presence and intensity of pain is too poorly related to the degree of damage to be considered such a messenger. Pain is a poor protector against injury since it occurs far too late in the case of sudden injury or of very slow damage to provide useful preventative measure. Instead, it is proposed that pain signals the existence of a body state where recovery and recuperation should be initiated. This places the word pain in the same class of words such as thirst and hunger, which signal not only a body state, but also signal the impending onset of a form of behavior. Pain is a way of being in the world, as Borg said. It is uh, specific to the individual's existence. And I often look at it as a call to action as an imperative, but it often to what Wall is saying occurs way too late in those experiences, it's reflective in nature. And it's not going to alarm us to something impeding because you're reflecting on what's already happened typically in those scenarios. I would, I highly recommend folks go read uh, Wall's article I was quoting on the relation of injury to pain, the John Bonica lecture that's from 1979. I also uh, highly recommend Casser's paper, which is on uh, just titled The Function of Pain by Casser, C-A-S-S-E-R. It will probably challenge some people's biases about like evolutionary adaptations of pain, which is a common narrative that goes with pain as an alarm. I am uh, far less confident in the narrative of evolutionary adaptation as an affordance than I was before I read that paper. I think it takes care of most of those questions. All right, so there was a few others that popped up, so I'll switch over now because I think there are a few great questions here. Have you ever considered addressing stress urinary incontinence in athletes, even though this is not a pain issue? It would be a rehab issue. It exists in a lot of athletes and can be a deterrent to resistance training, especially in women and new lifters in general. I've had a very hard time finding meaningful information that addresses this. In fact, I've recently had a urologist tell me the only thing that would help me is surgery, and he would not do it unless I decided to stop lifting indefinitely. Well, mm -hmm. I think right here we can go back to our negative messages yeah. that aren't really efficacious. I do have these conversations with athletes, especially um, my female athletes that are wanting to resistance train, not my area of expertise. I have some recommendations. I think reaching out to Mayor Alapatu at the University of Florida, who does a lot of research in this is great. And then there's also Sandy Hilton in Chicago. Um, both of those individuals, I cannot recommend highly enough when it comes to this topic. And I certainly do not think you need to stop lifting, but there are individuals that are much better suited to have this conversation than I will ever be. Yeah, we really need to, we keep saying this, uh, and it would be nothing more than just like sending Merrill a message. We need to do a podcast on this topic with her because I trust her opinion on the topic. Yeah, I, I defer all basically pelvic health questions to Merrill. She's an expert on it. She's phenomenal at what she does. I cannot speak highly enough about her. Um, we certainly need to have her on a podcast. Um, I think this one's definitely teed up for me. What are your thoughts on the concept of physical literacy in relation to injury risk reduction, specifically in regard to ACL tears? Do you feel the idea of higher levels of exposure, confidence, and diversity in movement at a younger age would be correlated with lower injury rates? Yes. Can I just stop there? Um, really, this gets at that principle of you need to be an athlete before you are a specific type of athlete. And when we're talking about physical literacy, I, I always go back to this analogy. No parent would let their kid go back to or go to school to just go to math class, or at least I certainly hope not. Like we accept that in your education system, you need math, you need language arts, you need some type of humanities. However, we then turn around and say our kid needs to only play one sport. 
And it's not so much that the one sport does the damage. It's the fact that you've painted yourself into this very narrow window. Kids do need to know how to throw a ball. They need to know how to kick. They need to know how to carry something. These are our fundamental skills that should be part of athletic development. And we really do need to facilitate those. I'll take it one step further. I think a lot of adults lose their physical literacy. And we need to go back and, and teach them to quote unquote read again. Like there, there's no reason a 30 year old shouldn't be able to throw a ball or kick a ball or run a little bit. And it's not because we're getting older and we can't do things. It's because we're getting older and we don't do things. And we need to make sure we're keeping that literacy as we age. That's it. That's what I got. Oh, I don't have anything to add to any of that. Um, are there any last minute questions? Anything you guys want to talk about? Um, it looks like Tony also asked a question about any guidelines on ACL rehab for those who went the conservative route, um, AKA no surgery for a full tear. Um, basically somebody looking to return to a level one sport at a recreational level. I don't know if get, you guys saw that one or not. I did not. Um, get yoked would be my first recommendation. Uh, I've never seen anyone who I thought had too strong of a quad. Um, I would do the Eric Mara reductionist thing here and say, get your quadriceps as strong as you can to where you can accept those loads. And then it also comes down to that participation practice play algorithm of starting out with what you can tolerate in sports specific and then making it progressively harder until before you know it, you're actually doing the sport itself. But I can't overemphasize get yoked is the biggest guideline. Also need that as a t-shirt. That's that's a cooking with adhesions episode just waiting to happen. I'm surprised I haven't done anything with egg yolks yet. I was about to, yeah. You could do cocktails as well. Just but not the egg yolks, yolks, egg whites. Yeah. yeah, that's true. It wouldn't fit. And then I don't know if you guys saw the one from Ingrid um, as well. Um, what are your recommendations on evaluating local clinical partners for PT who would take more of a strength and conditioning approach versus the more prevalent passive modalities or subluxation model with chiropractic, athletic, or academic-based rehab facilities? So uh, Talk to people. Yeah. It's, this is one of those where it, it's funny because I feel like the conversation about specificity versus variety has come up in different flavors this weekend. And I think when it comes to building your networks, variety is integral. Uh, I think most people on this talk would accept that the odds of finding a good clinician are not that high. Well, if our probability is low, then we need a lot of exposures in order to find the ones that matter. And if that's the case, then I need to go out and meet a lot of people. And I meet, I may meet, 20 strength coaches that I don't deem worthy for every one, but for every one that I do meet, that makes my life easier. I mean, my, my algorithm in life is essentially a yes, no. Do you make my life easier? If yes, I want you around. If no kick rocks. And the more people I can find that help me along my journey, the easier every component of my life is. And I have some strength coaches that I trust to the, into the world and back. And I think they're phenomenal what they do. Um, I mean, one of them I met um, because I was helping a neighbor move a couch. It, it wasn't like I was out seeking strength coaches that day. Another was introduced to me in the Bay area uh, because he was friends with the same physician who ended up training me. It wasn't like I was seeking these people out, but you have to be willing to have that exposure and go meet people along the way. Yeah, I think that's you, to build a referral network necessitates trust. And if you're going to trust someone, you got to get to know someone. So I think that's going to be the biggest aspect of that. Um, and the ones that I have referrals with at this point, like we've worked well together for a number of years and we do trust one another and that's why it works. Yeah, I think it does go symbiotic in that, like, once you start building those relationships, 
you know when the other person is better off doing it than you are. And I think in terms of figuring out where your level of expertise is, one of the things that really is a sign of a good clinician is knowing where your limits are. And I think too often we want to hold on and do more than where really our level of expertise is. But at that point, it's not about our personal growth. It's about the athlete's growth. Like if I have their best interest in mind, I may put them with another coach, but I may still talk to that coach. That way I can learn why they have the rationale to be at the tip of the spear in, in this return to sport program. Yep. Parker, I'm not touching that question. I missed it. How about Nathan's? Do you guys see that? Oh, that's a Mike. Mike, that's TDU, buddy. <laughs> um, I, I would ask what you mean by education. What are people saying? That's my biggest concern. You're not going to ask what he means by pain? Uh, I mean, I would love to. If someone has an answer, I'm all ears. Um, I would say that when I talk about education, my thought process is probably better phrased as communication. And when it comes to sense making, it's specific to the individual. And that's why I was using the example of if every time they go and bend down to pick something up, they think they're slipping a disc, then we can work through that narrative and discuss it. We're going to communicate with one another, but I'm not going to turn on the fire hydrant and blast them with information of things I think I know about pain. <clears throat> Another Derek classic for quad sets. Yeah. It's that ACL. Yeah. So I, I'm pretty notorious in the volume versus intensity conversation about just framing it of you haven't done enough. It's, this is where I would say I probably channel my inner CT Fletcher. It's the, okay, well, I'm not even going to tell you how many of these you need to do, but whenever you feel like you've done enough, just do 10 more and then you're almost there. So that's Ramiro trolling me. I think that's it. Uh, I agree. I don't want to answer that other one. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Once we stop the recording side of this, I'll happily answer that question, but I'm not, not doing that on a hot mic. It looks like one actually just popped up. In those scenarios about patients being afraid of flexion based on a narrative of slip discs, do you use behavioral learning strategies to support the communication um, like have them bend over and pick something up. Yeah, for sure. Potentially. I mean, some folks I can just say like, yeah, that's not really something we need to worry ourselves about. And they're just fine. Other folks are going to need that little bit of guidance along the way where I get them bending over and picking things up. The flexion conversation is interesting because the easy educational component there, as far as like communicating to them about what they think is ongoing in their spine is like, we actually have our spine move dynamically throughout activities of daily living all the time, unbeknownst to us. And then specifically in things like resistance training, the spine is moving dynamically under load uh, in variable amounts, whether it looks completely quote unquote neutral to us or not. And so those are just talking points. You'd be like, I understand you're worried about that. Did you know that we actually have the spine going through various types of movements, whether the area looks neutral to you or not. And so those are just kind of talking points with them. And then we can work through that. And they'll be like, usually what happens is that's counter to what they've heard. And they're like, well, have you heard of what so-and-so said with this certification where they said I should do X, Y, and Z? We can talk through that stuff and make it individualistic to them. All right. Um, so I'll do, uh, well, could you repeat the source of the philosophy quote you had earlier? Yeah, that's from Stillwell, an active approach to pain. Stillwell and Hartman. Um, we actually did a podcast with them, episode four, I want to say, on the Pain and Rehab podcast for Barwell Medicine. So that would have been 2019. And then his paper's Inactive Approach to Pain. Do you work in treatment programs or single session? Um, it depends. I do one-off consults both in my clinic and with Barwell Medicine all the time. I love when I'm able to just have a conversation with someone, provide reassurance, giving them a game plan, and they can go implement it without me. I think that's awesome. 
but there are folks who have to have consistent uh, follow to the long guidance. Uh, usually like post-op cases I see, uh, that's gonna be a necessary aspect of the, the discussion and seeing them regularly in clinic. Uh, but outside of that, like, it's very rare that I'll consistently have to work with someone that's a non-trauma, non-post-op case. I may do like two or three visits with them and then they start feeling more and more comfortable. My usual stance on this uh, that I often say when people ask me like, how long is this gonna take? I'm like, let me get out my magic eight ball and we'll figure this out. Because in a lot of scenarios you have no idea, especially in those non-trauma, non-post-op cases, like we don't really have a solid grasp on how long the individual is gonna take to get to where they're gonna be. But I'm here for as long as they feel like they need me. Some cases that may necessitate to me saying to them, you don't need me and you need to go on and conquer the world without me. Other cases I may say like, we need to spend a little bit more time together, most likely based on what you're telling me. Well, I think even here, it kind of goes back to that networking conversation. And one of the most amazing parts of the internet is being able to reach out and have conversations with coaches around the world. Uh, just last week, I had a consultation with a lady who had had a patellar dislocation and she was wanting to get back into training and had been told a lot of, frankly, BS. And she was located in New York City. And I told her, we went through the consultation, I made my recommendations, but it really sounded like she needed someone just to watch her do things. Like she needed someone to sit there and take her through a jump program and show her it was going to be okay. Luckily, I, I know a clinician that I trust in New York City. I was like, well, you could follow me for coaching and that would be one thing, but that's fine. You're going to be uploading videos. You would be much better off working with somebody who's going to be able to sit there and tell you everything's going to be okay and take you through a progressive jumping program. Yeah. Uh, it's money out of my pocket, but I would much rather that clinician be able to sit there and reassure her in real time than me make any money off of that. Yeah, I think our especially our remote work has a selection bias to it. There's, there's definitely been cases, uh, Cameron can attest this to it. I know that we have been like, I don't think this is going to be the right fit for you. Not because we didn't feel as though we couldn't help them, but because just given what they needed, it would do way better working with someone most likely in person. And we even try to find people locally if we can, if we have contacts there. Just wondering about the implicit versus explicit beliefs that unless the person experiences the movement, would it be difficult to facilitate a change in a belief? I would say it depends on the person. You know, I have to have conversations with them and then believe the things that they are telling me. So I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying every person I ever talk to is going to necessitate some type of consistent guidance with rehabilitative intervention. I think that's it. Yeah. Well, I will stop recording. I appreciate you guys attending this weekend. Hopefully it's been beneficial for you. If you guys need anything, you want to talk about things further, you want references, you can always email us. Our emails are readily available out there. Uh, I think they're probably in the packets you guys got as well. But thank you guys for taking the time to spend with us over this weekend. And I hope you have a good week upcoming. Mm -hmm.